Ismail Hussain, Director of the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Um, we are truly delighted to welcome Ambassador Michael McFall to the university today. He's one of the foremost experts, both as a scholar and as a practitioner, on Russia and on democratization and authoritarian interoperability more broadly. He's the author of eight very well-regarded books and a co-editor of another 14 on um, post-communist Russia and the broader questions of democratization and democracy existence. He has served in government as a special assistant to the president and the senior director for Russia and Eurasian Affairs, and was then appointed the United States ambassador to the Russian Federation in 2012 2014. There, he became widely known for engaging Russian society through meetings, social media, public debates, and cultural events. This was such a broad and intensive involvement that, in fact, when he went on the Stephen Colbert show, um, he had to deny that he was, in fact, not a member of Pussy Riot. <laughs> he subsequently returned to Stanford as the director of the Freedom Spotlight Institute, a, the professor of political science, and the big fellow at the Hoover Institution. In short, at a time where Bashar al-Assad is busy flying back from Moscow, um, there's no one better place to analyze Russia-US relations than Michael McFall, and we're very delighted to welcome him here today. Thank you, Anna. So, thank you, Anna. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here. Kind of a bad week to be here. Are we still in mourning? We watched the game. Um, Harbaugh, if you may recall, used to work at Stanford, and my boys love him, and we still don't know why he did what he did on that fourth down. But anyway, um, I'm going to help cheer you up, okay? Um, or at least enliven you and, and, and provoke you a little bit. And we're going to talk about Assad. We're gonna, I'm going to answer any questions you have about what's in the news today. Um, but I want to start with a, a big question, because I'm... You know, I'm at the University of Michigan, right? Uh, I'm not at the Council on Foreign Relations. So I want to ask some big analytic question. I want to answer one big question. And it came from, oh, I, I, I did that, didn't I? I got ahead of myself already. So it came from a lunch I had with my neighbor. So I was away for five years, right? And you know how it is, you go on a trip and you, your neighbor asks you, where'd you go? And, you know, just say, oh, I was in Burma for three weeks. And I say, oh, that's very nice. And then they move on, right? Like, like uh, it's hard to engage people sometimes with your own stuff. And so I want my neighbor, uh, I'd been out of town for five years. He said, come on over, let's have lunch, let's catch up. And uh, I went through and started to tell him about my time in the government and my time working with the Russians. And it was pretty depressing what I was reporting, right? Uh, all of this stuff happened while I was the U.S. ambassador. And in some ways, if you look at this list, you've got to go back pretty deep into the Cold War to remember a time when all of these bad things were happening in terms of Russia's relationship with the West. And I want to emphasize this particular slide. This is about just the, the, it's about both the United States and the West, right? Annexation, that hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, Russian intervention in the neighborhood. Uh, threat to use nuclear weapons, you know, we thought we were done with that uh, at the end of the Cold War. We're now at negative 83% uh, in terms of our approval rating as a country uh, inside Russia. Um, and our response to that has been pretty negative too, just to be clear. Uh, this year he let them off the list when he spoke to the General Assembly. But last year, when the president went there, he talked about the three greatest threats to the world, and it was ISIS, Ebola, and Russia. That did not go down well in Moscow, by the way, to be on that list. Uh, sanctions of Russian officials, that's like a first. I mean, you, you gotta go back, there's no place in history that we sanction the chief of staff of the Kremlin, let alone these major companies. NATO's now focused on fighting Russia. They've been, Russia's been kicked out of the G8. Uh, and most Americans, as I'll show you with some data in a minute, now again see Russia as an enemy. That all happened on my watch. And remember, correlation and causation are not the same thing, right? <laughs> You're smart enough to know that because we're in Michigan. But I'm telling the story to my neighbor, and my neighbor's a great storyteller. And he started telling me about his time dealing with the Russians. And he got very nostalgic. He said, well, that's kind of strange. You had that bad of a relationship with those guys because I really had a great relationship with them. And my boss, Ronald Reagan, 
actually had a really good relationship with their boss. And because of our individual relationship at the top, that was his theory, we ended the Cold War. My neighbor's George Schultz. Uh, he was the Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan. And as I got up on my Schwinn one, you know, one speed cruiser, I used to have this giant black beautiful car and bodyguards and never had to worry about traffic. And I don't have to worry about traffic actually at Stanford either, but, but the, the vehicle's a little more modest. Uh, I got on my Schwinn cruiser and, and rode home. The question is, what happened, right? What the hell happened between George's time in government and our time in government? In fact, all I want to do for the next 20 or 30 minutes is explain those two pictures. What happened between that moment and this moment over here? This is in Los Cabos, by the way. I was at this meeting in 2012, and the meeting was actually worse than the photo suggests. <laughs> so I'm somewhere in between a recovering bureaucrat and an aspiring professor, right? I'm somewhere in between right now in my life. So I'm going to bounce around a little bit between kind of big theories and anecdotes about my time in government. And I want to walk you through kind of three big arguments, three different ways to explain the, the photos I just uh, described. And for those of you who are social scientists or IR theorists in particular, uh, you know, this is actually, you'll, you'll see the structure of this, right? Um, the, the first one I'm going to go through is, is a kind of structural theory. It's about the nature of the international politics. The second one is about foreign policy and, and our interaction with Russia. And then the third one is about internal politics in Russia. And, you know, I see Ron Suni here, so I, I, I'm reminded this is like the difference the, on the spectrum between structures and agency, right? Structures is that, you know, big variables make things happen and we just are the expressions of them as individuals. And on the other side of the spectrum is, yeah, there are these structural things that, 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 that shape us, but at the end of the day, individuals matter. Actors matter. People can make history, right? That's the spectrum probably in a lot of social sciences uh, and a lot of uh, writing about it over the last couple hundred years. That's what I'm going to walk you through and let me give you my bluff right now. Anybody know what a bluff is? B-L-U-F? So this is really interesting. When I speak in Virginia, everybody in the room knows what it is. Here in Michigan, you don't know what it is. It's an acronym from the Pentagon. I learned from General Petraeus uh, rather rudely one day because I didn't know what it was. My bottom line up front, bluff. Very good thing for academics to think about using, by the way. Give the people where you're going ahead of time in case you run out of time and you don't get there. So my bluff is I'm going to come out on the actor side. I'm going to walk you through these other ones. But at the end of the day, I think the driver of this story is domestic politics, is actors, and heavily on the Russian side. So if you disagree with that, you know, and I know there are people that are going to disagree, now you can start putting together, you know, alternative explanations as I go, because that's where I'm going to end up. But let me walk you through a couple of these first. So the first one, nature of international politics. I, I don't know how you teach it here anymore. Oh, it's running. Good. Uh, at Michigan, but this is, this is, you know, what in the old days, my colleague Steve Krasner would call a, a structural realist theory. And the argument here is the nature of international politics is about power and the balance of power in the international system. And so as countries get more powerful, they threaten their neighbors. Sometimes they annex the territory of their neighbors. This is just a map of Europe over the last thousand years. We're now at 1335 for those who are watching. Uh, note that Crimea is not part of Russia. Uh, <laughs> takes a long time in this map before it appears as part of the Russian, Russian Empire. Um, and so this theory just says, this is the way it is. It's been this way for a thousand years. Russia is just behaving like any normal great power, right? Invading their neighbors, that's what, that's what great powers do. And that's what this map illustrates, right? So that's one theory, very popular in Moscow, as you might expect. They were down on their knees. They were crushed because of the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. But now they're back in military terms and economic terms. And now you're just seeing this kind of natural correction in the international system, Russia pushing back because they're powerful. Now, part of it is true, right? Part of this 
and you're going to see, I'm going to pick and choose from these different uh, explanations. And, and to, just to point out the, the obvious thing, that if Russia had no power, had no military, uh, we wouldn't be worrying about them invading Ukraine or inter intervening in Syria or threatening NATO countries, right? We wouldn't. So let's just think of like a, you know, an extreme opposite. Anybody from Moldova? I know I'm in Michigan, so I got, you know, uh, uh, nobody's from Moldova. Good. So, and I don't mean this as any disrespect to Moldovans. I, I love Moldova. I've been to Moldova. I actually was, the last time I was there, I went with the vice president. Uh, and as we were getting on the plane to go home, he said, that's the largest crowd I've ever spoken before. 40,000 people came for him. Uh, just because he's in the news today, I was thinking about Moldova. So uh, nobody's worried about Moldova invading Europe, right? Because they don't have the, the, the power to do that. So the power piece is a necessary part of the explanation, but I don't think it gets you a complete explanation for a couple of reasons. One, I can think of some countries that rise with power and don't invade their neighbors and don't confront the international system. Uh, Germany and Japan after World War II. Uh, Poland, I mean, just think about Poland. Poland had lots of territorial claims after uh, the collapse of communism, and yet we're not, we're not worried about them invading their neighbors and redrawing lines along the, the, the scenarios of that map I just put out. And I just spent a big chunk of the summer in China last summer, and maybe it's just too early in the story. I don't know. It could be. But right now, the, the notion that China is going to gobble up uh, its neighbors and threaten its neighbors, I, you know, uh, it's not inevitable that that might happen. There's got to be something else that we add to the story. Moreover, and more proximate to the Russia story, I don't remember the speech, and this is a dangerous crowd, so there probably was one, and you know it, and, and you'll tell me about it in questions. Uh, in Los Angeles, I can say that with more, uh, and no, I'm on good territory. That, that was unfair to my friends in Los Angeles and UCLA. Um, uh, but there wasn't, it wasn't like Putin was just waiting to confront the West and invade Ukraine and bring all ethnic Russians together. I looked hard. I don't remember the speech where he said, we need to bring Crimea back in. In fact, if you go back to 2008, he says quite definitively, we're not going to do that. That's not part of what we're doing. And in fact, when I was U.S. ambassador to Russia, his number one project by far was one that you probably never heard about. It's called the creation, and it's now been created, of the Eurasian Economic Union. That's what he was focused on. And this is his counter to the EU, right? Bring all the former states of the Soviet Union back into this economic organization. And to make it run, to make it tick, he needed Ukraine to be a member. All of Ukraine, not just Crimea. You know why? Ukrainians buy Russian stuff. All 45 or 48 million of them, depending on you count. Uh, how many people here have bought, anybody buy something made in Russia that didn't come out of the ground recently? Do you guys sell, we, we can buy beer in Menlo Park where I live, uh, Baltica Siem if you know it. You, you know it, okay. <laughs> you really know it, you, you, you shook very vigorously there. <laughs> how about Baltica Dievet, have you had that? Because it's really strong, it's much stronger and not that good. Anybody else buy anything made in Russia? You know, when my, the, made in Russia. What did you buy? Oh, well, the, yeah, this is unfair. Okay, all right. Uh, he's an outlier. Um, most Americans, uh, except some that, that study and know Russia well, uh, don't buy many things made in Russia. Ukrainians do. And it was a big part, you know, Belarusian and Kazakhstan was not going to carry this union. They wanted all of Ukraine to be in. So something must have happened along the way of that project to make him pivot away and to do something that, in my opinion, guarantees that Ukraine will never be part of the Eurasian Economic Union. Something more proximate, right? Last little anecdote. Anybody at the Olympics, by the way, with me in Sochi? No? Uh, I was there. I was there twice. It was fantastic. It was a great, I had, I had a great time. Um, you should, if you spend $50 billion on a party, it should be a great party. And, but it was. It was a great party. 
It was a great event on many ways. And one of the messages, maybe you watched it on TV, the opening or closing ceremonies, but the message of that event was not, we're, we want to be in a confrontation with the West. The message was, we're the new Russia. This is not the Soviet Union. This is not 1980. We're the new Russia. We want to be a respected member of the international system, and we're back in that way. Two things really stuck out. 20,000 kids dressed in these really colorful outfits, being super friendly to all foreigners. Even me. I mean, we're, I'm going to get, we're going to get to some places where the regime wasn't so uh, nice to me. The people, it was, uh, you know, I was a rock star there, as was the American delegation. And two, a more subtle message, but I, I know it was on purpose because I know the, the people that put it together. There was a moment at the closing ceremony where uh, across the stadium, 50,000 people in the stadium, uh, they had portraits of famous Russian authors. By the way, just a footnote, just think about that for a minute. How many countries could have 50 portraits of Russian authors go through a football stadium and people, A, knew who they would be and, and would applaud. Not sure we could pull that off. And it was, it was moving, it was, it, was, it was really cool. And two of them were really, really jumped out at, at me and my, my colleagues that there, were there. Solzhenitsyn and Brodsky. You wouldn't have saw that in the 1980 Olympics, right? This was a reclaiming of all of Russian history. We're not afraid to even celebrate those people a week later, they invade Ukraine. So there's got to be more to the story. All right, I'm going to go faster here. I've gone too long. So the second argument that, you know, is uh, popular in the United States, actually it's popular in Russia too. It's all our fault. All the Americans' fault. Uh, and it comes actually in two different varieties, and I want to walk through them. The first one I think is more important than the second one, but I want to talk about both of them. So the first one is... Um, we caused this all. We took advantage of Russia being weak. We lectured them about markets. We lectured them about democracy. We expanded NATO. We bombed Serbia. We invaded Iraq. We supported color revolutions. And Putin just had to push back. Enough was enough. He had to react to all of this pressure on Russia. Right? And again, just to keep myself honest here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refute myself from 30 years ago. But it's important to remember that concern about this backlash is something that many of us who have followed Russia have been concerned about for a long, long time. Uh, I wrote about it, uh, all, how long ago? A long time ago. Uh, actually, one year before the August coup, by the way, if you, if you, know, if you know your Soviet history. Uh, the, the, this piece is one of the best pieces I ever wrote. It compared the Bolshevik Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Soviet Revolution, where I talked about that the Soviet Union would collapse and then the moderates take over, but they wouldn't be good enough, and so the revolutionaries would come in, and then there would be a backlash, and you would have a Napoleon or Stalin-like figure, strong man, coming in to restore and push back. And then I talked about why they were different. The tragedy is I published it in the San Jose Mercury News, and nobody's ever read it. But I just want to say, I don't want to dismiss this argument, right? That there was this concern, especially, I would say, in the 90s. But after all that stuff, we had a different trajectory in U.S.-Russian relations. After all that negative stuff, we had one of the most cooperative periods in U.S.-Russian relations, you know, probably in the history of our two countries. At least that's our perspective, my perspective, and I know it's the president's perspective. We called it the reset. Uh, that was our policy. It was very simple. It was an idea that in the transition from uh, him winning the election to going into government, uh, we did transition reviews, and we looked at the Russia policy, and he looked at it, and he said, I don't get it. Why, why is there so much tension with these guys? On most issues, our interests are aligned. Do they want nuclear weapons to proliferate? No. Do they want Iran to get a nuclear weapon? No. Do they want more trade between the United States and, and Russia? Yes. And therefore, we developed this idea that there were many what the president called win-win outcomes that through greater engagement with the Russian leaders, we could realize them. That was our policy. Um, 
This, by the way, is my first day in the Oval Office working at the White House, uh, my third day on the job, uh, and it's also his third day on the job. Uh, he's about to call Medvedev for the first time uh, to begin to articulate this, this new approach to our bilateral relationship. As I walked out, a, a, a former Bush administration official who was still on the staff said, you're never supposed to touch the desk. Uh, nobody told me that. Um, and I think that may have been a Bush administration thing because there, <laughs> there were lots of people touching Obama's desk, but I don't know if that's true. All right, we got some things done. We got some big things done, in, in my view. Uh, this is them signing the START Treaty. We got rid of 30% of the nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, second, Northern Distribution Network. You probably haven't heard much about this because we didn't talk about it much. But this is a supply route, very complicated one, through the north into Afghanistan that when we came into office was just a trickle of stuff. It didn't even exist. Uh, by the time I left the White House, it was over 50% of our supplies. Military supplies, lethal supplies, were traveling through Russia to go to Afghanistan and our soldiers were flying through Russian airspace to go to Afghanistan via Kyrgyzstan. The last time that had happened was in World War II, okay? And, and I wanna emphasize, these are not just kind of namby-pamby, marginal, you know, let's hold hands and sing kubaya to make our relations better. I was always against that. I, it was never the goal of Reset to have improved relations with Russia. It was always, we got some big things we need to get done, and we'll do it through engagement, right? This was vital to our national security interest, because when we came in to office, 95% of our supply routes went through Pakistan. And we developed a new policy, AFPAC, as we called it, uh, towards the region. And one of those ideas was that if we had good intelligence, we were going to go after terrorists in Pakistan including one very famous one that I, sh I know you all know about, when we went in 2011 against Osama bin Laden. We would not have done that had 95% of our supplies been uh, had gone through Pakistan. Because the Pakistanis did close them off. They were pissed off at us for violating their sovereignty. They closed it off, but we had this other route. Really big, important thing we got done and only could have done with cooperation from Russia. Third, Iran sanctions. We put in place the most comprehensive set of sanctions against Iran ever, 1929, UN Security Council Resolution 1929, and we only could have got that done uh, with the Russians, and Medvedev in particular. Without them, we would have never got that done. And, and finally, um, in this, this vein, I just want to remind you of you know, dogs that don't bark, right? History's always written about outcomes that happen. I want to remind you of one event that you probably didn't read about because it didn't become the crisis that Ukraine or Syria became. And that was the almost genocidal ethnic war in Kyrgyzstan in 2010. I say almost because there was a revolution there. People died. The government was overthrown. Bakiyev was overthrown. It sparked ethnic tension between Uzbeks and Kyrgyz inside the country and people started to get killed in the south of Kyrgyzstan. 300,000 Uzbeks left and were in, Kyrgyzstan, in Uzbekistan, and Karimov was getting ready to retaliate. And for me, as a government official, without question, these were the scariest days and weeks of my time in the government, because I thought we were going to witness a genocidal ethnic war that we did not have great options to try to stop if it got going. But it didn't get going because of our relationship with Russia. Because back then, unlike now, the president called Medvedev and said, we both have a national interest in avoiding a meltdown of the state in Kyrgyzstan. By the way, at the time, we both had bases in Kyrgyzstan, the Russians and us. Um, and through negotiation and through interacting with our partners there, Karimov hates Russia, just so you know, uh, hates Russians, hates Putin, hates, hates all Russians. That, that's too, are we on the record? Okay, okay, let me just, I, if I was speaking, I, I know how to express that more diplomatically when required to. Uh, uh, so we worked with him, other people worked with the other side, and we, that is a dog that didn't bark. All right, and then we got a bunch of other things, I'll skip that. We, you know, we did like counterterrorism. This is, this, is, this is Colorado, just four years ago. Russian and American soldiers jumping out of airplanes together. That's not 50 years ago, that's not 1991. 
That's four years ago. And we got a bunch of economic things done. We got them into the WTO. We got PNTR. Uh, we raised, we increased travel between our countries. Uh, trade went up as a result of this. It's pretty modest, but it was going in the right direction. This is all through the, the, the first reset years. Travel was up. Our approval rating was up. We peaked at around 60% during this period uh, in terms of their attitude towards us and vice versa. This is what Americans thought of Russians in 2010, 61% positive view. All of that happened after NATO expansion, after the Iraq War, after the Orange Revolution. So my point is, you've got to be able to explain both our negative moment now and this positive stuff. And you can't go back in history to use the same set of factors to explain both. That's the argument I want to make about why this is, is partially flawed. Now there's another one that's very popular, and you're going to hear a lot about it between now and November 2016, from my Republican friends. And I have friends who are Republicans. They're real friends. Um, why is all this happening now? It's because Obama's weak. Obama didn't push back on Putin. Uh, created the permissive conditions for this bad behavior, and Putin took advantage of Obama because Obama sent the wrong signals about what the United States might do should he do these more provocative actions abroad. And in particular, this, this debate heated up after uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. In fact, I, I feel a little bad because he's now you know, decided to step down and the next time I give this talk, I'm going to take this quote out. But uh, he did say it, so you know, you gotta, I have to live by my words, he's got to live by his. I don't know if you can read that, but let me, I'll read it to you if you can in the back. So this is John Boehner about, uh, this is just an illustration of the point uh, that I just made. When you look at the chaos that is going on, does anybody believe that Vladimir Putin would have gone into Crimea had George W. Bush been president of the United States? No. Even Putin is smart enough to know that Bush would have punched him in the nose in about 10 seconds. That's a direct quote from our speaker. Um, now, with more time, I would tell you how we were punching back, to, to mix the, Boehner's metaphor with policy, well before Ukraine. And, and maybe we, we might want to talk about that in questions. But the real point I want to leave you with is every time a leader in the Kremlin has thought about using force in his neighborhood, he turned to his, you know, his American specialist, right? So I used to do this when I worked for Obama. We would talk about Iran or Syria, and, and they would turn to me and say, you know, McFaul, Obama would say, he always called me McFaul. I like ambassador better, by the way. Thank you. Uh, McFaul, what are the Russians going to do? And I would explain. So they, they have a McFaul in the Kremlin. Ivan Ivanovich. Is your name Ivan by chance? No. Okay, all right. Uh, Ivan Ivanovich, what are the Americans going to do if we invade Ukraine? And the answer's always been nothing in terms of a military response. And by the way, Bush was president when Russia invaded a country in August 2008. And he just coincidentally happened to be sitting in the stadium with Putin in China when it would happen. So if he wanted to, he could have climbed up and just gone and punched him. He actually had the opportunity. Obama never had an opportunity to do that. But he didn't. Nor did even Ronald Reagan when the Soviets uh, collaborated with their proxies in Poland to crack down. There was no military response there, 68, 56. So I think this is pretty consistent. What's more interesting is the response afterwards. And let me provoke you in, in, in suggesting that I actually think the Obama response, and it actually would be more accurate to say the Obama-Merkel response, has been more like Ronald Reagan's response in 1981 to Soviet aggression than George W. Bush in 2008. Do you know how many people Bush put on the list, sanctions list, 2008? Just guess. How many? Zero, right. Do you know how many companies he put on the list? Zero. Do you know how many arms he sent to Georgia? The one thing they did is they, they, they had a cruiser come, or drive, you know, dri drive's not the right word, sail up next to the border. It was the USS McFall, that's why I know this. Um, <laughs> That's about all they did. So I think that's pretty consistent. So, okay, if it's not great power, balance of power, and it's not U.S. foreign policy, let me just conclude with this last variable, which has more to do with the nature of Russian domestic politics and their 
particular responses to some new challenges that happened very recently. And two are most important to me. The change from Medvedev to Putin and the demonstrations against falsified elections in Russia in December uh, 2011 and spring 2012. So the first one was, you may remember, that Putin decided he was going to run for president again. And he told the president, Medvedev, that, you know, we're going to do this little switcheroo thing and you're going you're to go down to the White House. I'm going to take over in the Kremlin. Medvedev was not, did not want to do this. I know that for a fact. But, you know, Putin's the big dog. He's the big decision maker. And they announced rather emphatically, as you can see from this photo, I'm running again September 2011. And... Uh, I was still at the White House then, and I remember the day, actually it was like two or three days afterwards, we were in to brief the president about something else, and as we're leaving, he pulled me back in, he said, you know, Mike, what do you think is going on here? What is this going to mean for us? And I said, I'll admit, because we're off the record, um, well, you had a great relationship with Medvedev, and he did. President Obama had a, 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 a rapport with Medvedev, and so that capital investment in that relationship was going to be diminished. But I said, Mr. President, Putin's always been the big dog. He's always been the main decision maker here. So we shouldn't expect a big change in foreign policy as a result of this. And the president said, I respect your opinion, Mike, but you're wrong. This guy is different. And he's, he'd met him a couple times by then. He said, this guy is different. This is going to be a lot messier than what you described. Uh, and he turned out to be right, because it turned out, as we learned over time with Medvedev, uh, in, in the post-Medvedev era and the Putin era, that their worldviews were radically different. Despite this tandem and working together, Putin does see the world in zero-sum terms. He doesn't, the, the phrase win-win outcome is not one you're going to find in any speech he's made about foreign policy. Uh, he sees us fundamentally as a competitor to Russia. You can cooperate with competitors, right? Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. But fundamentally, we were the enemy, as he was trained as a young man working in the KGB. And that, that has kept with him ever since. And this third one became most critical and most, uh, the biggest barrier to cooperation, is that Putin has a theory about American foreign policy, which states that when we don't like a regime, we use our covert and overt force to go and overthrow those regimes. And there's a lot of empirical data to support Putin's hypothesis about American foreign policy. It's important to understand, right? And we would have these arguments with him. And, and, and Obama would say, I'm different. I remember one time they met in 2009 and, and, and Putin went on like this 10 minute riff about how stupid the war in Iraq was. And the president, who's a, who's a very good listener, much better listener than I am, by the way, uh, patiently listened through this all. He had his hand in his chin, uh, his, his chin in his hand. And at the end of it, he said, I agree. I agree, Pr Prime Minister Putin. We don't disagree about that. And, and he went back, and, and that was weird for Putin, because he, you know, he, he has this, this theory that there's actually a kind of unitary state. We have some blue book called the American National Interest that gets handed over from president to president. And it's written by the CIA and the Pentagon. That's his, that's his theory. He assigns tremendous power, especially to the CIA, for reasons you might understand, because his intelligence organization that he came out of has that tremendous power in his system. Um, and don't get me wrong, the CIA does have a lot of power uh, and does do a lot of things, but not nearly to the extent that Putin thought. And in particular, I'll just go through these things quickly. Egypt, 2011, those people there, I was working at the White House at the time. I actually worked most of the 2011 on the Middle East and not Russia. We had nothing to do with that. Putin didn't believe us. Same thing here. Eventually, we had something to do with it, right? But not in the beginning. He didn't believe that. And Syria 2011, we had big arguments about Syria, especially, obviously, because of his ally there, Mr. Assad. And those people were acting autonomously from the CIA and the Pentagon and, and the State Department. Putin didn't believe that. And that, that, pro, that disagreement about the nature of our uh, foreign policy had a fundamental 
constraint on moving forward with the reset, especially when I got to Russia. And that's the second point, right? I wanted, I wanted you to r remind you of these other demonstrations in the Middle East, because in Russia it later happened. And here's what happened, right? There was a falsified election, December 2011, just like all elections in Russia have been falsified over the last 20 years. No big deal. We got together, talked about it, 5%, 7%. That's normal. It's Russia. Uh, that was our, you know, intelligence analysis. That was the cable that we wrote about it in terms of no big deal. But these people thought it was a big deal. These people who are richer now, more educated, more connected, with better smartphones so they could photograph the falsification and then spin it around on Twitter and Vukontakte and Facebook. And it went from 50 to 5,000 to 50,000 to 200,000 demonstrators on the streets of Moscow at the end of 2011. The last time that had happened in Moscow was 20 years earlier. This is Manej Square, for those of you who know Russia. And you also know what happened at the end of 2011. That's the year the Soviet Union collapsed. And that's the prism through which Putin was seeing these demonstrations, right? So his first reaction, he was pissed. I mean, I remember one day I, I was at a, a meeting with him, and he's like, those kids, I made them rich. How can they turn on me? You know, that Yeltsin guy, you know, he didn't do anything for them. And, and how could they turn against all that I've done for them? Uh, oil and gas prices had a little bit to do with uh, them getting rich, but if you're, a Demo if you're an American or Russian and you're a president, if it happens on your watch, you take credit for it. And that was his first reaction, was just anger at these young people. But his second reaction was fear, because he was remembering this time before and he was watching what was happening in the Middle East. And so he pivoted against them. He needed a new argument to legitimize his, his uh, his, his presidency, even during the election, by the way. This happened before he was finally elected later in 2012. Um, and part of that was to say that these people were lackeys of the West, agents of the West, and that the United States, yet again, just like all those other slides I just showed you, was out to overthrow his regime. And that became an argument that he made to his people, an argument that he made to me sometimes, uh, personally, and he most certainly made to my bosses, that no matter how hard we tried to argue with them, that that was not what we were doing. We could not convince them. And so we had a return, and actually I think it was, it was even greater than some of this, uh, the way that we were portrayed back in the Cold War, where we're doing these things. We're funding uh, opera, you know, NGOs to overthrow him. We are, oh, here's, and then it got personal for me, just a few on this. Um, you know, the Navalny, who's this opposition leader, right? He was always touted as my project. I'm the guy that created Navalny. Um, um, and I'm in good company here, right? It's Gorbachev and me that are the, the, the masterminds behind this. Uh, one uh, particular time they said, and the evidence of it, of course, is that McFall sent Navalny to Yale to study, uh, to which I tweeted, how would a Stanford guy ever send anybody to Yale? Uh, but nobody else thought that was funny. Um, then they made it personal in 2012. They put out calendars. This is the English version, so it was both for external and internal consumption. All the calendar months are different opposition leaders. This is a poster from uh, the May 6, 2012 demonstration, one that turned violent and, and actually was very pivotal. Uh, there was crackdown and, and some of these people were arrested. Uh, and I am being, if you can read that, I, I don't know if you can see it, and I don't know if you can read it. I know some people can read it. And, uh, but it says, May 6th, the political circus is coming back to town, and I am portrayed there among these other opposition figures as the artistic director of the circus. Uh, here I am campaigning for Navalny. Um, that's photoshopped. I'm not campaigning for Navalny. Uh, I wish I had hands that big. I could play basketball better. Um, uh, here I am when he was running for mayor. This was circulated frequently. And then this one, I just want to give you a flavor for the way they talk about it on TV. You don't need to understand Russian to get the flavor, okay? So, for those that don't understand Russia, 
They're talking about how I've been thrown out because I didn't lead the revolution. But it was a big holiday when I was named for the opposition because I'm a specialist on revolutions and Obama, he, I don't have that plane by the way, uh, was sent to Russia to give these people their instructions and lead the revolution, including these fascists. That's Navalny. Okay, you get, you get the sense, right? That used to be on TV every day when I was ambassador. This argument about who we are and what we're doing. This is more recently. This is just from a few months ago on Channel One, uh, Mr. Kiselov's show, for those of you who know Russia, uh, where he's comparing the ideology of the leader of ISIL to the ideology of Barack Hussein Obama. Okay? So, two last things. I've gone on longer than I wanted to. Two last things just to tease you with. One, I want to emphasize that Putin's particular response to this mobilization against him was, was, was a choice. It wasn't inevitable uh, that one had to crack down on them. And in fact, Medvedev, President Medvedev, while he still was president, he had a different strategy. He had a strategy of co-optation. You know, pacted transitions is what the language that we would use about democratization, where he got together the leader of the opposition, that's who he's meeting with there, including on the far end, uh, Boris Nemtsov, who was tragically killed uh, earlier this year. He's meeting with them out at his dacha to try to say, okay, we should do some reforms. Uh, I want to do that. I want to work with you guys. Let's have a new electoral law. Let's have direct elections for governor. Let's set up an independent television station. I'm willing to do that in order to defuse this situation. Putin, when he came in, pivoted away from that. Uh, that was a choice, not something that was, that, that, that was forced upon him, in my view. Um, and yet, even during this period, I, I want you to, to understand that Putin is a great compartmentalizer, right? He can tell you that you're leading the revolution against him and he's gonna crush you which he did one time to me at his house uh, where his bodyguards around and not mine. Uh, he didn't say crush. He said, we're going to stop you. We're going to make sure that you fail with your revolution, McFall. Um, uh, and then in the next breath, say, we got to work on getting chemical weapons out of Syria. We got to work on exploiting our natural resources in the north. He called the Rosneft Exxon Mobil a joint venture, which has now fallen apart, the most important event in U.S.-Russian relations in 40 years. That's his view. And that was 2012 to 2014, this, this going in a negative way, but still, you know, on occasion, in this limited way, engage with us. Until this. This was the last straw. When, as you would recall, there were demonstrations, I, I won't go through the whole history of it, but demonstrations against Yanukovych for not signing the accession agreement. We then got involved, the Russians got involved, the Europeans got involved to try to get them together to negotiate a transition, to have elections later in the year. And on February 21st, I remember it, I was in Sochi at the time with uh, our Deputy Secretary of State, big euphoric moment, we thought we had a deal between Yanukovych and the opposition. Eight hours later, Yanukovych left, he showed up in Russia, and the whole thing fell apart. And we didn't quite understand why he left as fast as he did. I have a better sense now, but it was all what happened to that deal. But for Putin, it was clear. Consistent. It's what we do. We overthrow regimes. We overthrow people we don't like. And now we were overthrowing a regime, a leader that we don't like on Russia's border. And that's when he struck back. That's when he, in an emotional way, in a tactical response, to, he's got he's to have some counter to what happened that day. That's when he decided to go into Crimea. And when that was so easy, that's when he decided to go into eastern Ukraine. So to conclude, there's a good news and bad news piece to my explanation of this history. The good news is I don't believe that Putin has a grand strategy to recreate the Soviet Union. I don't believe he's been sitting under a map since he was 13 dreaming about putting the Russian Empire together. I don't believe that. And I don't believe what I just uh, uh, explained in terms of when these things happened, how they did, uh, that you, you see the evidence for that. Nor do I believe because of the balance of power 
or Russian culture or Russian history that we are just doomed to be in a competitive, confrontational relationship with Russia forevermore. I have a different theory here. I have a different explanation that has to do with concrete actors making concrete policies in specific circumstances. The bad news is Putin's not going to change again. He's done. No more compartmentalization. He's done. He has now told his people that they are fighting a war with us, a war with evil and a war with Nazis. He's not going to turn around and start negotiating with the devil or Hitler. He's locked in. And I would remind you, he can stay in power till 2024, and the guy works out three hours a day. Um, he gets to work around 1 o'clock. Um, and so I don't see that changing as long as he's there, and I think he's going to be there for a long time. The real question in my mind, and I'm just going to open it as a question and then take your questions, is do we understand it that way? And therefore, will we have the same kind of lock-in lock strategy to, to deal with Putin's Russia. And I'm not so sure, but I want to end there. Thank you so much. Great, fire away. Yeah. And tell me who you are, just so I know who I'm talking to. Oh, hello, many. Uh, Mr. Marco, thank you for your speech. My name is Alexander Krivenko. I'm a long student at the University of Michigan Law School. I'm from Ukraine. And I wouldn't yes. And so my question uh, Which part of Ukraine? East part of Ukraine. I'm from Haki. Okay. So, you know, it's very close to Belgorod. And yes, very close to Russia. I've been there. I, nice city, right? It's a great city. <laughs> Fantastic city. My, my question will be about international security challenges. Back to 1994, Ukraine had in the, served in the world nuclear weapon potential, and we gave up it uh, in, in accordance with Budapest Memorandum and the security guarantees of the United Kingdom, the United States, and Russia. And uh, Russia is the one who is supposed to guarantee our security. Now she, uh, this country has committed aggression against our country, and a lot of Ukrainians still don't see how the United States or the United Kingdom <coughs> help us to get through uh, this situation, and most importantly, that other countries which engaged in negotiation on giving up nuclear weapons or other type of weapons, they always point to Ukraine and say, look, Ukraine has done it, and now they lost part of their territory, the first, uh, the first case in the modern history of the world. Right. So how would you address these challenges? What message we as international community send to other countries? Thank you. The message is a very bad one. I mean, let's not, let's not dress it up in any way. Uh, it's a bad one for your secu the, the security of your country, obviously, most importantly. But it's a bigger message in terms of uh, a negative message about nonproliferation. Because you're absolutely right. I've been in the room uh, in other places. We used to do this uh, nuclear security summit when I was in the government, right? And, and it was an idea to, to help on the proliferation, uh, nonproliferation agenda. And we would always invoke Ukraine. Uh, this, this can be a good story for you if you do this. Um, and obviously, what happens subsequently now undermines that argument. And, and there's, no, there's no way to explain that any other way. Now, you know, the administration, if I worked in the government uh, and I had my talking points in front of me, I would remind you that that wasn't a treaty. Uh, it was a memorandum. That's, that's why it's called the Budapest Memorandum and not treaty. And I would remind you that it takes, everybody has to do it. And, and, and you know, I know the gentleman that, that was there for it. He actually works for me now. He, he's the Defense Secretary Perry. Uh, Bill Perry was there at the time. Uh, and that would be his argument. Like, like we, did not, we did not promise that we would send troops to Ukraine to defend you uh, had Russia come in. But the, the other point is, in 1994, nobody was thinking that that was going to happen, right? So I don't, want to, I don't want to excuse it. I, I just think what you said is right. To me, the moving forward, it means we have to, to do what we can, in my view, to increase Ukraine's ability to defend itself. That's how you correct for not being able to, to defend the, the memorandum. That's my view. And by the way, help Ukraine on economic reform. To me, the most, the biggest, 
variable, the biggest drama in your country is actually not, a, not the threat of Putin uh, coming to Kiev or Kharkiv even. Uh, the biggest threat is economic collapse corruption. And, and corruption. That's part of it. So, so we need our obligation, if you will, uh, from Budapest 1994 is to be more engaged in those kinds of things moving forward. Yes. And, and on May 19 at the USA Canada Institute uh, this year, uh -huh. uh, the Deputy Chief of Mission, Lynn uh, uh, Tracy, at our embassy, spoke. Yeah. So, and I challenged her on our policy uh, towards the Ukraine. And I would like to share for comments uh, that challenge and questions that I raised. Okay. Uh, and this How about one question? What? Well, well, no, the whole thing. And then you can do the response. Okay. All right. she, she was tortured by it. I feel fair to torture you by it. Okay. Uh, based on his in, in, intensive study of the Maidan massacre, the Canadian political scientist, Ivan Kachanovsky, concluded that much of the shooting on February 20, 2014, was carried out by opposition forces, not by the then government. So I can stop the, you there. I disagree. Well, let me finish. All right. There's just a lot of people there. The, the intercepted it. exchange Sir, of the ex Estonian uh, foreign minister with Catherine Ashton, a following German public television report, and a later report by the BBC, led credence, a lot of credence to Kachanovsky's conclusions. Yeah. To what extent are the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and the U.S. government aware of this? If the U.S. government is aware of this, why is it ignoring it in its Ukraine policies? Got if it. it is not aware of what uh, seems to really happen in We are aware, sir. We are very aware. Why is that the case, and what difference could such an awareness make in its policy towards Russia? So, uh, fair question. We're very aware of the, all those reports. So we're not naive about what other people are saying about who shot whom. Okay? But because it's not true. So, so you can shake your head and say it's not true, but you asked me for my opinion, and based on a ton of data, lots of data from the government, and since I've been out of the government, looking at it very closely, this theory that is being propagated, there's just no evidence to support it. And, and I know some people that were shot uh, in Ukraine, uh, personally. But the, the overwhelming data, for, I mean, you, we can disagree about the data, and you can send me your data, and I'll send you other reports. I'd be happy to do that offline. But, the, but my, my looking at the data, and I take data pretty seriously uh, as an academic, not just because as an ambassador. This is just a myth that the Russians floated to say that they had nothing to do with it. Um, and so, you know, we, c we can argue all we want about what the data is right or wrong, but I can tell that won't be a very productive argument for us to do right now. Yes, I know Ivan. I know him well. He's a, I know him well. He's wrong. <laughs> Please. Uh. <clears throat> and one last thing. Why is it always, just if I, if I may, because I worked in the U.S. government for five years. What, this, this theory, just because this is like a Putin theory, right? This theory is like, okay, we are so damn clever that we're going to pay the, gov the opposition you know, to kill their own people. They're, they're going to kill their own people as a way to, 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 to foment this revolution. And I, I just would plea with you that the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian opposition, the American government, we're just not so clever. <laughs> we're, it's just usually the most simple explanation is the correct one. And, and we, you know, there's even some of the shooters that have confessed, right? And Yanukovych himself, frankly, made a mistake. The Russians wanted him to crack down. He tried, and then he backed away. And I would just plea for, you know, usually the, the, the most straightforward answer is oftentimes true. And our ability to, to manipulate people with guns in third countries thousands of miles away is really weak. Sorry, I, I, go ahead. My name is uh, Gus Amaru. Uh, because most of uh, Russia's Muslims are Sunnis. Yes. Do you see uh, Russia's intervention in Syria as, uh, the, uh, as, a, as a source of uh, instability in the future for Russia? Yes, I do. 
uh, with the caveat though that it depends on how long this goes, right? So there's there's already you, you can already see it uh, just to just to to get to put some more context to it, right? So Putin, you know, I skipped over Syria because I wanted to get to Ukraine and these other ones and Russia, which is way more important to him. But his argument was always when we would sit with him, the way you deal with instability is you back what he would call, we, we call them dictators, he would call them modernizing strongmen. And by the way, it's not just about who your allies are. This is, over, this is too simplistic. He, he considered Mubarak and Assad both to be modernizing strongmen, that were moving their backward societies in the right direction. That's his, that's his view. And, 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 and so it wasn't just you know, our guy versus your guy. And whereas he thought of us as being naive about these societies, being naive about uh, Muslims, and being naive about uh, terrorists. Now, our argument back to him is, if this thing goes on longer, this is back in 2011, right? Uh, right now, there's a chance for evolutionary change. If this goes on longer, then we're going to get to a violent, protracted violence, and that's, that's the... That's the play area for the extremists, right? And back in 2011, ISIL didn't exist. Well, maybe they existed. I didn't know the acronym at the time, and they most certainly weren't in Syria. And that's the argument we've had. Four years later, you know, his policies failed. Let's just be clear. He, he, he backed Assad, and four years later, by, his, by the definition of his objectives, not, my, not what, what I would assign to be Russia's objectives, uh, his ally is weaker, controls less territory, and is facing uh, bigger allies. And that's why he decided to double down with the military intervention. Now, what he wants to do now is to polarize it, uh, to eliminate all third parties, and there, there are dozens of them, by the way, not just two or three, and then to turn to the rest of the world and say, it's ISIL versus Assad. Uh, what's the lesser of these two evils? We need to support Assad. That's his strategy. And already, to your question, the discussion of that in the Sunni world, in the Middle East, and in Russia is, uh, you know, to, to state the obvious, very negative. Because what they're seeing on TV is Sunni Muslims being killed by Russian planes, right? That's what's on their media platforms. They're seeing that every day. And that will, that will in my view, come back to haunt him, including, you know, there are extremist groups in the Caucasus right now. It's not like Chechnya they succeeded. They did not succeed in many of the other republics. And I predict you're going to see more uh, activity in those, those areas in the coming, coming months. Yes? Yes. Oh, I didn't. I, I had. So great question. I have a, a lots of slides, but I didn't bring them. I'll, I'll send it to you. But the bigger, the big, the question you're asking is about. Well, I, I don't. When will the economic story have influence on his policy? Um, and my honest answer is I don't know. I, I have no idea, and I would not trust anybody who tells you that they do know. Okay. Um, and I say that for a couple of reasons. One is our ability to understand Putin is constrained uh, for lots of reasons. He's, he's good at not being, uh, you know, uh, we have all kinds of intelligence uh, gathering capabilities, right? Mr. Snowden talked about them. He came to Russia when I was still ambassador. Uh, Putin understands those and he, he does well to avoid them all. And so understanding the way he thinks and how he works is hard right now. Um, number two, just to state the obvious, but I think it's important to remember the obvious, the, the institutions to mediate societal preferences within the state, right, the, the, are all weak or controlled by Putin. So if you're pissed off about Putin, uh, you can't go to, the, there's no opposition figure in Congress to go complain about the president, right? He controls most of them. You can't go on Fox News now and say, that president, he's an idiot. 
There's no Fox News now in Russia. Well, you know, there's little dozed and things, but it, there isn't that. Um, and there is, uh, even in terms of, of expressing negative preferences towards Putin, remember that they live in a, in a place where people are constantly worried about being monitored. I mean, when I was ambassador, nobody would ever bring their cell phone to a meeting with me. Oftentimes, we would have to meet in third places uh, because of the, the, that's just the, the atmosphere that people uh, express their views. And therefore, you know, in terms of opinion poll data, and, and I know we have people are more expert on that than, than I am here in the audience, but, but, but it's hard to get accurate data, at least we thought in the government. It's hard to get accurate data when all the polling firms but one are loyal to the state. And just to make it really blunt, like, you know, you're sitting out there in Rostov or, or Vladivostok, and some stranger calls you out of the blue and says, in the context I just described, I'm a pollster, and I want to know, do, do you support Putin? <laughs> There's only one rational answer to that in Russia, as far as I'm concerned. There's no upside to not saying I support him. Which is to say, we, are, we don't even have a, I don't think we have a very good feel for where public is. And I can tell you anecdotally that even in the regime, that uh, I know lots of people that think this is a huge, giant mistake. This whole thing is setting back Russia 10 or 20 years. But they're not going to say that because of the, the atmosphere they work in. Um, what I would say is, because of all that, that we won't see the signs of it very, uh, you know, in real time. But once it begins to happen, it'll, it'll happen in a very quick way, the, the reaction against it. Um, but when that happens in the future, I don't know. And you know, when really pressed, you know, will Putin be voted out of office? I, I am skeptical that that will happen. And so are you, I can tell by the way you just smiled. Yes, way on the back. I apologize for ignoring the backbenchers. Yeah. Oh, right here, right here and then there, right? Why don't we get the microphone to her for the next one? Hi. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Jerry Matitas. Uh, given Russia's current economic situation, uh, do you think they're strong enough to maintain a long engagement in Syria and or possibly take over some small neighboring country? Just want to say again, political scientists are horrible at these kind of predictions. So are economists, and so is the CIA, okay? So we're all in this together. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a stab at it, but I'm very sensitive to how bad we are at these kind of point predictions about the future. Um, I don't think it'll be an economic constraint. Putin is locked in. He's doing things not in a kind of, you know, let's check and see how this is affecting the GDP. Uh, moreover, I would, just to go back to the story I know best, because I was still in the government, it's very clear to us and clear to me, because I know a lot of these people, um, that when the decision was made to go into Ukraine, the economic team, you know, Shuvalov, Dvarkovich, uh, Ulakayev as Minister of the Economy, uh, none of those people who are very important figures in the government on economic policy, none of them were in the room when that decision was made. Uh, and so, you know, that circle that he's with has gotten smaller and smaller, and these, these economist types who used to have a lot of influence over him. And, and by the way, that's important to remember, it wasn't always this way. Putin today, the way he governs and who he listens to is very different, in my view, than it was in 2000. So they're not there, so I don't see the economic piece. Um, I, I do think casualties in Syria, if, if they are sustained uh, over time, will, will have an, uh, a, a negative uh, uh, impact in terms of his popularity. Already this war, even with all those constraints I said about public opinion, is not nearly as popular as the Ukrainian intervention. Um, and I am not, if by small country, if you meant a NATO country, my answer is different than other ones. If you meant a NATO country, I think the probability of that happening uh, was always low, but is lower today than it was a year ago. I actually think one of the things we should give credit to uh, the Obama administration and the other governments in NATO is they have taken deterrence seriously. I would like them to go further, just so you know. 
not because I want conflict with Russia, but because I think it reduces the probability. Uh, but I do think uh, it is lower today than it was before. And I would also just say that, to quote my mother, I apologize, I don't use this language, uh, but my mother from Montana, shit happens. Um, and, and I've been in a bar in Tallinn uh, with some drunk Russians and got beat up trying to defend my fellow American uh, colleagues. And I can imagine a scenario in Narva where a bunch of hotheads, you know, things spin out of control, somebody gets killed, and then, you know, it spins that way. I can imagine that. So I don't want to say it's zero, uh, but I think it's a lot lower than it was before. Please, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Vicky Novakova. I'm a senior at the Ross School of Business. Um, and so I'd like to turn to you more as a professor than your post-political career. And so um, politics are politics. People are people. Uh, they're often set different things. And so for the first time since my coming to this country when I was seven, I was discriminated against because I was a Russian American. And so... Recently. Recently. Mm -hmm. And so... It happens, it happened to be there because I live in America, so it goes both ways. Uh, my question is though, just maybe from a grassroots perspective, but how do you raise awareness that, you know, Russia's not out to get you in terms of the people, America's not out to get you in terms of the people, because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. So it's a great question, um, and it's true. Just, I, I, I share your sentiment, right? Um, when I was ambassador, uh, we had a very conscientious uh, public diplomacy strategy to say exactly what you said. Um, and it was, if you fo follow me on Twitter, at McFall, um, and you'll see I engage in this every day to distinguish between policies of the, the, the government and people. Um, and in the long run, uh, you know, in the long run, by the way, I'm incredibly optimistic about Russia. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute, maybe. but. Uh, I also believe that, that, that this stuff is, uh, is driven by elite actors and is not really the drama that people in either of our two countries want to be engaged in. I, I, I believe that, I've seen the data, and just anecdotally, I experience that every single day, right? I mean, I showed you some of the stuff that the, the regime said about me when I was ambassador, just a sampling, by the way. And yet, when I would show up at uh, college campuses, you know, there would be rooms like this and there would be standing room only. Uh, so bad that eventually the regime did not allow me to speak at college campuses. Um, and, and I saw that every day. And we, we you know, through cultural things, through the, all kinds of things, the more connectivity there is between our societies, uh, the, the shorter this interregnum of confrontation will be. That's my view. And so anything that promotes it we should do more exchanges, right? More, more contact. I always say, let me, let me take a kid from, from Russia and put them two weeks in Palo Alto. I'll change their view about America forever. I've seen it anecdotally many times. I just want to see more of that and vice versa, by the way, right? I mean, we need more Russia. We need more Americans going to Russia because we don't want to build these stereotypes the other way as well. So anything that can increase that connectivity, we should do. And uh, you should do it too, because it's your, I hereby designate you an ambassador uh, of public diplomacy. I used to do this at the embassy every day. Uh, you are most qualified to be able to be one of these, these bridge uh, builders. Thank you. That's very hopeful note. I'm afraid we'll have to end. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.